Welcome everybody, uh, Rush University Medical Center, Division of Phrology, Renal Biopsy Conference for April 4th, 2024. Hooray, 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 we have a CME code today. Um, we'll see how long that lasts, but uh, that's good news for today. Uh, we've got a complicated case. I think uh, try to pay a little more attention uh, than usual. Maybe that's uh, for me more than anybody else, but uh, it's a complicated case, so it'll be fun to discuss. A lot of funny nuances of this, uh, of what uh, is not an uncommon disease, but uh, an odd presentation. Um, we have nothing to disclose, and patient confidentiality is always being protected, as usual. Um, I want to um, wish everybody a happy Easter from last week, a happy Holy from about a week and a half ago, and uh, continued happy Ramadan for those that are, uh, are uh, following that. And with that, I think we'll move on. We have... Um, Dr. Coleman is going to read the case, uh, I believe. Uh, Michael, you want to uh, take over? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so this case is about a 34-year-old black man who presented to an outside hospital for lower extremity pain and weakness. He was reportedly diagnosed with membranous lupus nephritis about 20 years ago when he originally presented with leg swelling at that time. Despite recommending induction immunosuppressive therapy, the patient declined it and hasn't been on any immunosuppressive medicines for the last 20 years. Currently, at the outside hospital, his pain and weakness were thought to be secondary to lupus-induced neuropathy and myopathy. He had an MRI of his thoracic and lumbar spine, which were negative for core compression. The symptoms improved with high-dose steroids and Toradol. The hospitalization was complicated by sepsis from staph epidermidis, to it grew in two out of two blood cultures. And this was thought to be due to right eye cellulitis versus pneumonia versus colitis. He was initially treated with vancomycin, cefepime, coagul, and then was changed to daptomycin and ceftriaxone, and then ultimately switched to zosin. His course was also complicated by an acute kidney injury, altered mentation, fever, and worsening periorbital edema, and he was transferred to Rush where he received further workup. He was intubated, given IV methylprednisolone, and he was started on continuous renal replacement therapy for worsening renal function and volume overload, and started on empiric plasmapheresis. Uh, his baseline serum creatinine prior to admission was 0 0.9 to 1.0 milligrams per deciliter, with a serum albumin of less than 1.5 grams per deciliter. He had nephrotic range proteinuria, it was 5.5 grams per gram, which was thought to be due to his chronic lupus nephritis. His urinalysis had 4 plus protein, large blood with greater than 100 red blood cells per high power field, and 11 to 20 white blood cells per high power field. In terms of his review of systems, it was remarkable for lower extremity weakness and generalized body aches. Otherwise, it was negative. He didn't have any fever, chill, sweats. This is Michael to the dock area for delivery. No shortness of breath, no nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, diarrhea, rashes, or urinary issues. Uh, his past medical history is consistent with membranous lupus nephropathy, nothing else. Past surgical history, none, and allergies, none. He did not have any home medications, and he denied any NSAID use and herbal medications. His hospital medications on transfer consisted of IV methylprednisolone, Plaquenil, Capra, which he got a loading dose of prior to transfer. He got IV zosin, metoprolol succinate, lovenox, famotidine, and he was on a fentanyl drip. His social history consisted of never being a tobacco smoker, but he did smoke marijuana two times a week. He drinks alcohol socially and denies illicit drug use aside from the marijuana. He identifies as black. He has no uh, family history of end-stage renal disease or autoimmune disease in the family. His physical exam, uh, his temperature was 99.1 degrees Fahrenheit, blood pressure 155 over 122. He was slightly tachycardic with a pulse of 101. It was a regular rate and rhythm. Uh, his respiratory rate was a little tachypnic at 23, and his BMI was 30.1. He was obtunded, intubated, and not following commands. He did not have any oral lesions. His neck was supple and no lymphadenopathy. He had some decreased breaths in his lower lobes with mild crackles, but there was no wheezing. He had regular rate and rhythm. 
no lower extremity edema, and there were no rashes, no synovitis, and his neuro exam was uh, significant for four out of five strength in his lower extremities bilaterally. He did not have any focal deficits. At the outside hospital, his CMP showed a sodium of 130, potassium of 4.4, chloride of 105, bicarbonate of 19, BUN 44, creatinine 3.4 with a baseline of 0 0.9 to 1.0, glucose was 75, his serum albumin was less than 1.0, total protein was 4.5, calcium was 6.5, but this was not adjusted for the albumin, total bilirubin 3.0, and he had elevated LFTs, his ALT was 320, AST was 460, and alkaline phosphatase 475. The CBC showed a white blood cell count of about 7,000, hemoglobin was 7.9 with an MCV of 88.8, .8, and his platelet count was 68,000. Iron was 40, his TABC and TSAT were not calculated. He had a positive anti-cardiolipin IgG, IgM and IgA were negative, uh, <clears throat> T4 was 0 0.81, which was in the normal range, but his TSH was a little bit elevated. ANA was 1 to 1,280 homogenous pattern. C3 was 23, and C4 was less than 8, which are both low. His double-stranded DNA was greater than 300. SSA and SSB were greater than 8. His CK was 445, and lactic acid was 1.0. Your analysis showed four plus protein, large blood with greater than 100 red blood cells per high power field, and 11 to 20 white blood cells per high power field. Your in drug screen was positive for cannabinoids, otherwise negative, and as your in protein creatinine ratio is 5.5 grams per gram. His cerebral spinal fluid was clear, colorless, had zero nucleated cells, two red blood cells, glucose was 39, protein was 19, which is within the normal range, and infectious workup was negative, and there were no oligoclonal bands noted. His MRI brain showed diffuse meningeal enhancement possibly related to his history of CNS lupus versus meningitis, and his TE was normal without signs of vegetation. At Rush, his creatinine was up to 4.2, <clears throat> again with the baseline of 0.9 to 1.0. His serum albumin was 0 0.7, and we got a lipid panel. The total cholesterol is 205, HDL was 12, and triglycerides were 460. LDL could not be calculated due to the hypertriglyceridemia. CBC showed a white blood cell count of 5,600, hemoglobin of 7.1 with an MCV of 91.8, platelet count 72,000, peripheral smear with few schistocytes. Ferritin is 33,520, haptoglobin is 158, which is within the normal range. Adam's TS13 was pending, and fibrinogen level was low at 90. INR is 1.34, which is a little elevated. PTT38, also a little elevated. Uric acid, 11.5, elevated. Procalcitonin, 6.84, very elevated. HIV, EBV, and hepatitis studies were negative. C3 was 49, which is low. C4 was 10, which is low. Double-stranded DNA was greater than 300, SSA was greater than 8, SSB was 1.8, which is elevated. Chest x-ray showed diffuse bilateral interstitial and airspace opacities, and a bronchoscopy was done, which was negative for alveolar hemorrhage. A CT abdomen pelvis was done and showed hepatosplenomegaly and large periaortic lymph nodes. Renal ultrasound showed a right kidney 12.2 centimeters in length and left kidney 13.2 centimeters in length, with no hydronephrosis, no renal masses, or calculi noted. There was increased psychogenicity noted bilaterally, and there was no renal vein thrombosis. And a percutaneous renal biopsy and bone marrow biopsy were done. Thank you, Michael. Uh, there... Doc for delivery, please, Patrick. If you unplug your phones, I appreciate that, uh, fellows. Um, so uh, there were a couple questions in the chat. One was about, two people asked about ferritin, and uh, Bill got back to us. It was 33,500, and rheumatoid factor is pending. Uh, and, um, I'd like to point out, after 50 years of biopsy conference, we've now changed the format of the presentation from a Word document to an actual PowerPoint uh, set of slides. Uh, huge thumbs up from me, and I, it brought us uh, into the century. Uh, it's funny, you don't even think about these things. You just do it forever, but I, I like the look of this, so good call on that, and I think we'll 
go forward with that as opposed to the, uh, the standard uh, Word document. Um, any questions uh, in the protocol for anybody else? Dr. Glassick wants to know an LDH, uh, this admission at Rush. Uh, I will find that out for you, Dr. Glassick. The, um, the, oh, sorry, the, the full on uh, Word document or PDF is in the, in the uh, chat, though, if people still want to view it that way. Um, I have a couple of questions which I'm not clear about. Uh, was, uh, what was the indication for pheresis in this case? And number two, did the cultures, any of them grow anything? Uh, yeah, both. So he had, we had to try to simplify this case because you can tell already that it was this complicated. Um, he had gram positive uh, staph epi bacteremia at the outside hospital and two out of two cultures. And we weren't sure of the source of that. It was from the outside hospital. They weren't sure if it was due to uh, his cellulitis of his right eye or possibly even a, a, a staph epi pneumonia. Uh, when he came to Rush, he ended up having a Klebsiella pneumonia. Uh, that was uh, found by bronchoscopy. I didn't include that because uh, it just was getting more and more complicated. The indication for phoresis was empiric. Uh, when we when he came over, the differential was uh, obviously broad, but part of it was uh, TTP. And another part of the differential uh, at the time of presentation was catastrophic antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Uh, and both of those would require plasma phoresis empirically until we could sort it out. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Any other uh, questions? And I'm still still searching for the LDH. Sorry about that. He started I, on CRRT uh, when he arrived at our hospital. He came over with about a creatinine of four, and he was already oliguric. Quickly uh, escalated uh, once he uh, got here. The next day, the creatinine was five and a half, and he was oliguric and volume overloaded and intubated. So we we jumped right on the CRRT. And LPH is 381. Thank you, uh, Michael. Anything else? Maybe we should read the protocol again. It's awfully, it's awfully long and complicated. It was long, and believe me, there, there's a lot of things that we actually had to, to leave out uh, just because it was such a complicated case, but we tried to simplify as best we could for the presentation style. Thank you. Well, you know, along the lines of history, you know, it's kind of funny. I said we always did a, a Word document, but back when we did a Word document, if it didn't fit on one page, Dr. Lewis would go absolutely nuclear. So we're a little bit sensitive to, uh, you know, uh, what we put on it, but uh, we've kind of moved on from that. Now we have as many slides as we want, so, you know, um, we don't have to worry about the uh, constraints of, uh, of, a, of, of a Word document fitting on one page. Um, all right, poll number one, what do you think the pro predominant pattern of injury? This is how far we've gone with the, with the concept of pattern of injury. We're not even saying what it'll show. We're, we're using that in the poll now. What do you think the predominant pat pattern of injury in this biopsy will be? A, a POSI immune, lupus GN. We've talked a lot about that lately, but the idea here would be that uh, no subendothelial deposits. We'll forget about subepithelial mesangial, but a POSI immune pattern, uh, an immune complex, uh, more of an immune complex related uh, lupus GN. Uh, three would be a TMA, and again, this is the predominant pattern of injury. Four would be advanced lupus membranous, class five. Uh, number five is a podocytopathy, and number six would be an infection-related GN. We'll give you time to, uh, to vote here. I mean, I think if we have music in the beginning, we should get the Jeopardy music or something for this part. There we go. <laughs> Right on cue. Ukulele. Yeah. I think. Yeah, sweet Caroline. <laughs> Ukulele. Only 50%. Come on, let's get some more votes in. Let everybody vote. We, we don't call anybody out. We don't know who's voting for what. Anybody but the co host can vote. So let's get a few more in here. It's interesting what we're seeing. Um, a little bit of everything so far. Wow, that's fast. That wow, fast. boy, that's impressive. That is very impressive. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. You should put this on my CV. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's probably better well, than anything else like the CV for me. <laughs> what do you remember about Dr. Bax? Uh, uh, well, he was a nephrologist. He's, uh, he's a good doctor, but he was really technologically uh, advanced.
He was better as an engineer. <laughs> exactly. You know that uh, exactly, Roger. Yes, Dick. Yeah, that uh, that ferritin level sort of stands out and hits you right in the face. And I must say, none of these things in the list really would account for a a ferritin level of thirty five thousand. So I'm I'm sort of thinking outside the box here that something is going on beyond what we usually see in a glomerulonephritis and raises, particularly with the hepatosplenomegaly and the liver enzyme abnormalities of, uh, of, a, of a different syndrome than is listed here. Well, let me discuss the poll and then I'll hand it back to you and you can elaborate on that a little bit. So our poll has, I guess we're sharing the results, uh, a little bit of everything, but the winner by far at 50% is immune complex uh, GN. We've got... Uh, the rest is pretty close uh, with a, 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 a posse immune uh, GN, a TMA. Uh, nobody bought into advanced lupus membranous, which is his original lesion. Interesting. A podocytopathy, a couple, and a few are, are, are infectious related GN. So the number one is uh, an immune complex GN uh, related to lupus. Dick, you want to elaborate on this, on your uh, thoughts? Well, with hepatosplenomegaly and features suggesting uh an extremely high level of inflammation, I would be thinking about something like TAFRO syndrome, which is a syndrome of thrombocytopenia, organomegaly, and, uh, you know, substantially elevated uh, ferritin levels, uh, or as was suggested earlier on the chat, uh, you know, a macrophage activation syndrome uh, as part of the whatever is going on in the kidney. So do you think this is an independent process or just all part of the of his illness, if that were the case? I, I think there may be a connection with his lupus, uh, obviously, but I don't think the 20-year history of membranous is, uh, is a key factor here. Although, as you know, with longstanding membranous, you can get severe crescentic GM due to ANCA, due to anti-GBM, and due to non-ANCA, non-anti-GBM. So I suppose a crescentic form of GM uh, to explain the hematuria and the AKI as a complication of long-standing untreated members uh, is certainly a possibility. But so, I'm intrigued with the, with the uh, and I hate to you know, put my finger on one laboratory test in a complicated case like this. But we got to find an explanation for that fantastically elevated ferret. And I think that's fair. Fair. No, no, no pun intended. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Reen, uh, you, have a, you have a comment? You're blocked. You have to unmute yourself, Dr. Reen. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Uh, uh, the macrophage activating, I did put in the chat, and I it is possible it is related to lupus. And I'm thinking that uh, uh, I'm throwing another caveat in there um, that will go with the low complements with liver enzyme uh, involvement, INR high. Uh, production could be low of C3, C4 in the liver, hepatosplenomegaly, that will go with macrophage activating syndrome related to lupus. And now how you explain is proteinuria. He's a black gentleman and uh, you can get uh, with macrophage uh, podocytopathy such as collapsing glomerulonephritis. It, it, that, uh, that will be my thought out of the other diagnosis which you put forward. Yeah, we've been trying to include uh the collapsing ApoL1 story as much as possible, but uh, um, that's a very good point. Um, uh, let me ask my audience here, is uh, macrophage activating syndrome basically the same thing as HLH? Yes. Okay. Um, so, Dick, what lesion, if you think this is an HLH or macrophage activating syndrome, what lesion do you think that, that he has? Do you think this is uh, more related to that or more related to his lupus? Well, the renal lesion in TAFRO is commonly a membranoproliferative immune complex form of GN, uh, with or without crescents. So I would have to pick number two in the poll. 
but I would qualify it as saying the lesion on light microscopy would be a pattern of injury of membranoproliferative GM, which is the lesion seen in, in Tafro, which is largely a manifestation of huge increases in IL-6, uh, sort of a form of Castleman's disease. But I can't link Castleman's disease with lupus, so I'm kind of stretching things a bit by trying to explain that elevated uh, uh, ferritin level. Dr. Rubin, what do you think the path will show? I also think, as I placed in the chart, that this is an HLH. Um, I also agree with Dr. Glassock's um, impression that this is tafro, and therefore I also think it's going to show an MPGM pattern of injury. Uh, Dr. Kramer, uh, what do you think is going on? Um, very interesting case. I um, I was interested in the schistocytes on the blood smear and think that that's something to focus on. But um, the ferritin being really high um, is also interesting. And so, you know, think about the schistocytes on the smear. Then you think about it could be DIC. Is the is does the patient have like a systemic um, malignancy um, that is leading to DIC or is this TTP in the setting of lupus, which is very uncommon. Um, the HLH, I'm not sure if HLH can have uh, like a DIC like pattern. I'm, I, I, I really haven't seen that many cases of this, so would defer to Glassic or Dr. Rubin about that. I think um, a TMA is somewhat associated with it, but uh, I too don't have a lot of experience and I don't know how to, you know, the thing about HLH is I don't under, a I don't understand it and b it's usually a secondary phenomena, that's a, that's the limit and it has a high ferritin, <laughs> and maybe associated with TMA and I think that's the extent of my uh, knowledge uh, about that. Casey Gashney, what do you think is going on? Yeah, I think. Um, well, first, I think it's a very complicated case, and it's really hard to, without a biopsy, to just tr try to guess what the um, pathophysiology of the AKI is, but. Having said that, I think um, the two of two of the six on the list of differential that kind of intrigued me. One was the first one was that immune complex GN. I mean, the the person seems to have CNS involvement. The liver numbers are up, so autoimmune, possibly hepatitis, um, with very low complement levels. So an immune complex mediated process driven by lupus, and then you would see sort of that pattern of diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis and MPGM pattern in the kidney with a positive immune complex. So that, that to me is still the number one histologic explanation for this. But then, you know, the, a trigger from an infection, uh, you know, we, we, we do have staph growing in the blood. We have, um, you know, a really high procalcitonin level. Um, that ferritin is just so high that I don't think any of these diagnoses that are on this list can explain that except, you know, the macrophage activation or HLH. Um, and I'm not really uh, familiar with the data behind the association of HLH with lupus. So um, so I'm going to go with as my number one, and I think this, this patient is going to have an immune complex mediated lupus. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see some neutrophils or you know, maybe even like IgA in the middle of the mesangium as sort of an infection-related GN, I wouldn't be surprised. But if we see IgA with other immune complexes or other immunoglobulins, it could still be lupus. The other part is the anti-cardiolipin was positive. So, um, so you know, an antiphospholipid uh, associated with lupus uh, causing further renal injury uh, could also be seen on the biopsy. So if we see a DPGN, I wouldn't be surprised if we see some thrombi as well related to the uh, antiphospholipid. Yeah, I'm glad you Roger. brought that up. I'm glad you brought that up because I think that guy got, got uh, with all this information, I think that got overlooked. Yes, Dick. Roger, if this is Tafro syndrome, the, the bone marrow biopsy will be diagnostic because in that particular disorder, you see reticulum fibrosis and increased megakaryocytes. And I did do a quick survey of the literature and. Uh, 
uh, lupus is an antecedent for Castleman's disease, which uh, would be the link with the uh, the elevated um, uh, ferritin, which is a manifestation of high IL-6 levels seen in tafro. Uh, I don't think we can discount hepatosplenomegaly, a massive periaortic lymph nodinopathy, and uh, the manifestations of uh, uh, inflammation, which are the common underlying disorders seen in multicentric Castleman's disease. So I'm increasing my my diagnostic attraction to Castleman's disease and PAFRO syndrome. So Dick, let me ask you a question. You brought up IL-6. Nowadays, we have IL-6 levels available. Would that help you in any way, if it's high? Uh, gee, I don't know what the specificity of uh, IL-6 is. It can be elevated. Uh, it's dramatically elevated in Castleman. So I would say if this patient's IL-6 is like three to five times the normal level, that would be a strong item of support for Castleman. Thank you. Dr. Corbett, uh, if you could put the poll back up. Uh, Dr. Corbett, you and your and some fellows basically brought number one um, kind of into the uh, the rubric of lupus. Um, and I know, I think in our experience, and, you know, forget about all this extraneous stuff here. Um, there's a lot of extraneous stuff, which may or may not be relevant. But, uh, you know, I think when we see bad lupus nephritis, I believe number one is not more common than the than number two in immune complex GN. Um, you could a you could tell me if I'm correct. That's at least our experience. You could tell me if I'm correct on that. But more importantly, what do you think it is, Steve? What do you think is going on? Do you think it's just lupus? I mean, this is a RPGN presentation. Is you think it's just a bad GN, or you think it's something else going on? I mean, there's been a lot of great discussion about things that are very odd, which I am sometimes left in the in the dark about. But uh, the palsy immune story for us was in the African American population predominantly with you know the segmental lesions, uh, and it's always possible. But I for me, I mean, I look at two and three as being what might be going on here. I know you can't you can't deny this this uh, ferritin of thirty three thousand and think about HLH and how it might evolve the kidney. I mean, what I, I my limited understanding of this most common cause of acute of injury kidney injury with HLH is acute tubular necrosis, but you can definitely I think as Dick's already alluded to, you can see a GN as well, and it can be due to autoimmune diseases. But you know, when I look at this guy, I see this very hot lupus who's had severely you know active uh, serology i mean it, it, the c3 c4 on the floor double stranded dna is off the charts and yes that doesn't differentiate palsy immune from immune complex but i just have a funny feeling that this gentleman's going to ultimately have an Im immune complex mediated g and and may well have the tma on top of it we don't know what the adams 13 came back as uh but i don't know when i was as i was going through all of this those two things kind of came out on the top of my list. Plus, with everything else that was going on with infection, and and I, it sounds like he was hypotensive and he could have a, a severe ATN as well. But I mean, there's so many other things people have appropriately talked about that I'm not going to readdress, partly because I don't have the same expertise. Well, great. I think uh, that's a great discussion. I think it's time to look at the biopsy. So let's. Uh... Put it up and I'll spin the wheel. All right. Last few weeks it's been uh, Dr. Coleman, but he begged to read the protocol so he wouldn't get chosen today. <laughs> Michael, if it's you, you get to pick which other fellow has to read it. Oh, that is power. Oh, no. That is oh, power. Oh, it was close. It was oh. close, but it's Dr. That would have been fun. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been fun. All right, Keith, to give you a second. That would be fun. Uh, <clears throat> How long have we had the wheel now, Raj? Well, we've had a wheel since the 80s, but this version is about, I don't know, 10 years old now. It's Wait, just... can I pick another fellow to read? <laughs> no, you can. <laughs> go ahead and click on the screen. Oh, yep, you're controlling it. Yep, there you go. Ooh. All right. Okay, so here's a high power trichrome. We have multiple cores, like five or six of them. Um, on this power, um, 
I noticed this core that's very on the very bottom, there is a little bit more uh, blue staining material. So I would say maybe somewhere around 25%. Yeah, Casey, uh, uh, that's what I said. Yeah, kind of patchy involving uh, exactly that, that amount. Fibrosis. Okay. I don't see any um, hmm. anything odd. I see one glomerulus here, which looks really, really big. And I see a whole bunch of obsolescent glomeruli that are completely like hyalinized or sclerotic. So, um, so I'll comment on these at a higher power. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there were six gloms, uh, four globally sclerosed. So we're kind of dealing with a limited sample. Yeah. I see. Okay. So hopefully this big glomerulus here in the middle will show up somewhere in higher power. This is an H&E. Um, I see the Bowman's capsule. Is, I think this is an artifact that it's, it's torn here, but um, the nuclei, it's an increase in the number of nuclear cells here. Um, and I believe this is, this is necrosis. Uh, I, I think that down there, Casey, it, it's still intact. It's just kind of like a thick, it's, it's a thick section. Here? This yeah. This floating piece? Yeah, that floating piece. It's just it's attached okay. and thick. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't see any crescents. I definitely see very thickened basement membranes. I can see right here around two o'clock. Um, the basement membrane looks very thickened. So we'll see um, both higher powers. We see Jones stain and we'll see EM, but but there is definitely yeah. uh, almost like a wire loop. Yeah, and at 11 o'clock also, if you go up over there. Yeah, here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, now, you so we're not the calling term, it. You use the term wire loop uh, as a description for a thickened capillary wall. Uh, you know, this patient had membranous for 20 years, so it wouldn't be too surprising to see on the H&E a uh, thickened capillary wall. But I wonder, is this really wire loops, which are... I guess we'll, I guess we'll see better on the uh, on the fluorescent, but you're right. And that's why I said almost wire loop, because okay. I was hedging. Right. I was hedging. <laughs> okay. This could that's... be seen, this thickened basement membrane could be seen in, in pure membranous as well. Sure, yeah. Plus, my recollection is when you see a really good wire loop, it almost has a different tinctorial appearance to it, too, yeah. sometimes. Yeah, I mean, this almost looks a little bit more pink than some of the other areas, but I, I guess we have we have other images to look at, so yeah. just, well, I'll hold off on that. Yeah, yeah I, I, Casey, uh, also, uh, yeah, I, I like your description because uh, typically in membranous, it's more diffuse and uniform and lead pipe rigidity, and the wire loops tend to be more kind of scattered like this. Um, so you're agreeing with me? Yeah. <laughs> but I've also seen it in our clear. case. <laughs> <laughs> you gave it away a little bit. Um, there is uh, there is some uh, acute tubular damage here. Some of these uh, tubular epithelial cells look injured. But again, I'm going to just comment on that maybe at a different slide. So here's another H&E. Um, you almost see this lobular sort of cauliflower look to this. Uh, right. Right. So this is more consistent with that MG, MPGN pattern of, of injury. But this segment down here, David, uh, like seven o'clock, six o'clock or seven o'clock here, this, does this look or is this also different cut? This looks that, that, to that, me. That's um, extra glomerular there, Casey. Uh, the, the, oh. Those are like the distal tubules. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, yeah. Could you see how it everything kind of the? It looks like it's inside of the capsule. Yeah. Unless unless there is an artifactual disruption in the capsule, which sounds yeah, like yeah, it, 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 there is disruption there. Okay. There's definitely mesangial um, hypercellularity here. Um, I see that this here at uh, ten o'clock. I see some uh, increase in pink staining here. Um, I don't know. This is kind of hard for me to call this necrosis, but it doesn't yeah, look yeah. I didn't see any definite necrotizing lesion. Okay. All right. There's no crescents here. Yeah. And you can see the rupture. I, again, I don't know if this is artifact, but you see all these red blood cells in the Bowman space and then subsequently the tubule. I don't know if that's from rupture of some, some kind of a necrotizing lesion or if this is just an artifactual problem. Yeah. Yeah. Just artifactual. Okay. In so fact, is, yeah, he, here is that glomerulus on the PAS. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
All right, so here's a PAS. Uh, uh, definitely this expansion of the mesangium here. The, this is a hilum, correct? Yeah. And so I'm looking out here. There's some here. I actually almost see double contour. Yeah. I know. I, like almost see it. I see double contours here and yeah. here. So that's yep. all right. It looks like there's mesangial interpositioning in that first one yeah. nuclei throughout the periphery of the of the loop. Yeah. All right, here's a silver stain or a Jones stain. Um, it's pretty complex, but looking at the peripheral capillary wall, it's very irregular. Uh, it's got this sort of kind of a beaded appearance. It's thickened. I see, looking for some uh, spikes, which I do see on the outside. Yeah, he has a history of membranes, so that's not surprising. Um, this is the same beat up glomerulus. So I don't know if I should even be commenting on um, ruptures here, but uh, you know the, the the basement membrane seems like it's discontinued here. Uh, just keeping that in mind. But I don't see any holes. But these are so thickened that I think uh, these are probably you know e even if the, there's uh, on EM if there is uh, immune complexes uh, from membranous, I bet you there would be a basement membrane formed on top of it so that we may or may not see holes anymore. Maybe they're resorbed by now. Yeah. So let's see if there is fresh membranous or not. So so right now, thickened basement membrane, but no holes. There is spikes, but no holes or tears. And no tramp tracking. Uh, not here, correct, yeah. Because you were talking about the lobular appearance and stuff. Yeah. The only, the one that I would I would have thought would be maybe here, a little bit here there i see i see a basement membrane and then a couple of holes and then basement membrane over it so maybe here but i don't know and it may be focal enough uh, you know there that slide before had some pretty convincing uh double contours yeah this this loop especially right here yeah i agree uh so these are the tubules there's some uh acute damage uh well some of these basement membranes are actually a little thickened so this is subacute maybe, but there is some ATN. Um, yep. The the tubules up here, the basement membrane is actually wrinkled. So there's there's definitely chronic damage as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, this is uh, immunofluorescent. IgG is positive, both in the mesangium as well as the capillary loop. I can see here, for example. There's a good amount of deposits um, up here as well. Uh, they seem to be, are these subepithelial, David? Well, we'll have to see EM for that, but. Um, Doesn't it help if the some, outside some, is smooth yeah, versus some, the inside is smooth? Some are definitely granular or subepithelial, and then yeah. some, uh, like uh, keep going down, uh, yeah, right there. I mean, that looks like it's band-like, you know, like a mm -hmm. wire loop. But you're right, like Casey. The outer it. portion of that looks very smooth, so it looks like it could yeah. be subendothelial. Yeah, yeah. Whereas the other ones you were at, they, those might be intramembranous. It's just guessing, but yeah. yeah. And um, as Roger is mentioning, there is staining, there is granular staining of the basement membrane also with... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you mean Bowman's capsule. Yeah, Bowman's capsule, sorry. Yeah. Going on. Is it only IgG? No, it was uh it, it was it was full house. Okay. So here is a um here's a EM. Here's the blood space. Out here is the urinary space. Here's the basement membrane. So it's the podocyte. Um, this is that loop that I think we were seeing as thickened. So there's mesangial interposition. We see cell processes here that's between the um, basement membrane and the capillary space. So this is mesangial. mesangial. And, and then also subendothelial deposits. There's, there there's some subendothelial yeah. deposits. There's a lot of mesangial deposits. Uh, there's um, these loops. I can't see the lumen actually open, but there's a lot of deposits here. Almost yeah. occluded the lumen completely. Yeah, I think these are massive subendothelial deposits that are narrowing or occluding the lumina. Okay. And, and, and look at that, look at that other loop in the top left. Yeah, here it's, there's almost none, no space left. Maybe this is it, right? Yeah. 
so yeah, when you called those wire loops, uh, yeah. initially, I agree. Yeah. Okay. It almost seems like most of these are subendothelial. I almost don't see any any active subepithelial deposits. By active, I mean something that's been recently deposited. And then the podocyte itself, at least the ones that I can see the foot process here is diffusely effaced. Yeah. At the very top left, there's a subepithelial deposit, very top left corner. Yeah, but where, where's the membranous? <laughs> no, that's what that, that has a history yeah. of 20, 20 years of untreated membranous, and there isn't a single spike. Yeah, which is interesting. In the, given um, the, the silver stain. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, mean, I thought we saw some spikes on the silver stain. Yeah, the silver yeah. stain had a bunch. Yeah, maybe but then one glob. I mean, there's well, thickened well, capillary well. walls and thickened basin membrane, but. I mean, this is not the EM picture of a very advanced stage five chronic yeah, memory. This yeah. is uh, distinctly different. Here's another look. Um, here's the basement membrane. Out here is the urinary space. These massive subendothelial deposits with mesangial transposition. This entire capillary lumen is occluded. Um, there's there's a lot of this is this is heavily immune complex mediated it seems and diffuse foot process effacement yeah. and again no subepithelial uh, yeah uh, they, go, go go to the loop in the top right okay yeah, yeah. this one, right here one, <laughs> there's one this epithelial deposit yeah that <laughs> almost is a weird shape for a deposit yeah. it just it's kind of yeah. elongated it doesn't even look like a sub yeah. epithelial deposit but. And then we don't see it very often. There's deposits in Bowman's capsule down like around five, six o'clock. All yeah. the way around. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Uh, there yeah. you go. Here, you, now you have some sub epithelial on this side below the protocyte, and then they have some sub endothelial. Here. And then, then this got migrate to the left a little bit. Um, what do you see in the end of the, yeah, in, oh, TRIs. A little bit. yeah, right yeah, there in the cytoplasm, yeah, great, but no thrombi, right, David? No, I didn't see any thrombi. Yeah. And what percent, I guess, what percent of the two, how many of the two gloms were involved? <laughs> 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 I mean, I this is immune really complex good. mediated glomerulonephritis, and it, I think if it's both glomerulites, it's class four diffuse proliferative plus membranous, with yeah. you know because of that one little corner one. It's a class four plus five. Yeah. So I'm going to throw a uh, throw a poll out right now before we discuss kind of what how you put this all together with uh, all this uh, other stuff we talked about extensively in the beginning. Um, how would you treat this patient? Um, a uh, a cyclophosphamide based induction regimen, a uh, MMF based induction regimen, or tuximab based induction regimen, or an MMF based induction uh, protocol with uh, with uh, Benlista. <clears throat>
I think because of the signs of severe inflammation, hepatosplenomegaly and the other features, I would put tocilizumab in my hip pocket as a potential more specific therapy because it is the treatment of choice in, uh, in Castleman's disease. But here you're treating lupus nephritis, which I think is very reasonable, but it's still, I've never seen a patient with lupus nephritis, even with massive subendothelial, subendothelial who has this degree of, of uh, infl inflammatory processes. I've never, I mean, I don't measure uh, ferritin levels routinely in patients with lupus, but this is a very exceptional finding. In my I agree, experience. and I think that's a very good point. The question is, what do you, you know, that's a really good drug for, or those diagnoses, but does does that drug target a glomerulonephritis enough? Would you feel comfortable? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I think the rationale for cyclophosphamide is pretty strong here okay. because of the severity of the disease. But if the patient didn't get better and continued to deteriorate, I wouldn't hesitate to use uh, tocilizumab in this patient. And I and I don't have any. Uh, idea about this, but, uh, the, uh, you know, even a combined therapy, I don't know if that's crazy or not, but, you know, you're attacking two, you know, two different, pro not independent per se, but two different pathophysiologies. Uh, Dr. Corbett, how would you treat him? Just the way they voted. Okay. Yep. I'd like to point out just the way they voted. Five words. That's uh, Dr. Corbett's new, uh, that's a new record for you, Steve. I'm, I'm proud I'm of you. learning from uh, you. Less is more. <laughs> Less is more, yeah, but I'm always jabbing away. Uh, Dr. Gashti, how would you treat him? I agree with the choice of the drug. Uh, in a practical sense, I would, I mean, the guy is so sick. I don't know how, how much of a role sepsis is playing. So I would kind of just consider that in, in our equation to use. But I would use cyclophosphamide over the other three. Dr. Reed? Well, that's an interesting question. He had a, a sky high procalcitonin level, uh, which we did not address. And frankly, I'm one of those that I don't know what to do with it half the time. So I like some input from Bill and others. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, the significance of uh, the procalcitonin level and in our decision making. Um, Dr. Reen, you want to address that? I know you've got your hand up. Huh. He may be having a hard time unmuting. Did he? Um... Well, while we're waiting, I think uh, there certainly isn't any indication for continuing um, plasma exchange. No. Absolutely. Good Would everybody agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. I, Reen, I, I, I was know. thinking actually. Uh, uh, I, I still cannot get over that ferritin. So my choice would have been steroids and tocilizumab plus flux. That is what I would have done. Boy. You would have stuck with plex. Uh, macrophage or HLH type of picture. You know, that's a, that's a pretty high uh, uh, ferritin, very high ferritin. It has been reported with lupus. I know that for sure. Uh, but I, I don't think we can ignore that. Interesting. Well, I'm going to hand it back to Bill. Um, Bill, what sure. do you? Uh, how'd you put this all together? And tell us about the bone marrow, etc. Yeah, tough case. I think needing a little bit more information was helpful. So let me kind of give you a little bit more follow up. Uh, that's what we had at the time of the kidney biopsy. Uh, um, go ahead. So go ahead. You yeah, go ahead. But, thank you. Yep. Um, so the first thing was control the infection. We were able to hope adequately control the infection to the best of our abilities. Um, we stopped plasmapheresis uh, once we had the Adam TS-13 came back as normal, uh, and the we were pretty convinced that it was an antiphospholipid antibody uh, syndrome without uh, any definite uh, thrombi anywhere. Uh, the bone marrow came back as uh, HLH. It showed a uh, marked increase in um, macrophages, and uh, there was a hematology that sent off a couple of receptors and some genetic studies as well, which are mostly still pending actually. But the um, CD25 was 4,327, and that was uh, 
what they were educating me on was more consistent with a secondary type of HLH pattern, uh, that marker specifically. Um, knowing that it's secondary, knowing he had an infection, knowing he had bad lupus, knowing he had active lupus nephritis was another reason that we really needed the biopsy because if the biopsies showed this chronic membranous, which was unchained, they would have really had to look into other causes of, and maybe it was then more likely that it was the infection. So in this case, even though he had the infection, things were still pretty active after the infection was controlled. And hematology and rheumatology, as well as us, were pretty convinced that lupus uh, might have been his underlying trigger, especially when we had his kidney biopsy. And so that was the real reason, even though the bone marrow was helpful to make the diagnosis for the HLH, uh, the trigger for it, it was still necessary to get the kidney biopsy, knowing that, um, that it might be due to lupus. And so what we did after the infection was controlled is we continued or gave dexamethasone and then IV uh, cyclophosphamide. Um, and a little bit of follow-up. He was very, 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 very sick, uh, but um, he his admin improved a little bit. Now that he also remained oliguric and he remains dialysis dependent. So it might just be that he's not proteinuric anymore. And that's part of why his admin's coming up. His hemoglobin remained low, but it was improving and he's no longer transfusion dependent. He was He was transfusion dependent for most of his hospitalization and his platelets came up. His ferritin uh, markedly improved from the 33,000s down to 3,000. And his fibrinogen, uh, while it still remained low, it uh, came up quite a little bit. Uh, he remained with hypocomplementemia and a high double strand of DNA. Uh, and this is somewhere around six to eight weeks out that I have this data, but he's still dialysis dependent. But clinically, he's extubated. His mentation is markedly improved. He's sort of a normal kid now. Uh, clinically improved, very, very weak, and uh, in our rehabilitation center for prolonged uh, a rehab to, to recover from all this. Um, his pain and his uh, uh, neuropathic pain is also much, much better. So yeah, everybody really touched on this uh, during the differential. I think um, uh, I, I was actually getting even text from one of my previous fellow, Michael Langarten, who who saw the, hair, uh, the high ferritin right away and also texted me, HLH has got to be what it is. Um, and I just wanted to talk about HLH because it's not something that I'm not familiar with. We don't see it as a consequence of lupus very often, just like Dr. Glassick had said, um, he doesn't check ferritin very often in lupus, but we actually check it quite a bit because our lupus patients come in anemic. And if it, there's some iron deficiency there, we'll get that. And I, I, I really can't remember from lupus that how, that we see something this high for the ferritin. Um, we are, we're usually looking for it to be low uh, in, in diagnosing iron deficiency as a secondary cause of our anemia or is it due to something else? And so I think that, you know, when I see this high of a ferritin, it triggers me to think about HLH, and that's what I would want to talk a little bit about. So HLH used to be like a lot of our other diseases, uh, like membranous even, called primary and secondary, but the terminology, just like in membranous, is changing. And the reason that it's changing is because uh, the primary used to be the genetic ones. And the secondary ones used to be triggered by inflammation, whether it was from cancer or lupus or infection or something like that. But what they're finding is that even the secondary ones often have a underlying heterozygote or genetic predisposition and have the second hit, another one of our favorite things, of an infection or inflammation to, to uh, trigger everything. And so they're trying to get away from it being primary or secondary because secondary makes people think, oh, I don't need to send off the genetics. Uh, so they're trying to now split it into HLH disease versus syndrome, but that's sort of a semantic. Uh, the, the point really is that it can be triggered by massive inflammation and often has an underlying genetic predisposition. Um, it's really due to too many macrophages, or sorry, uh, too much macrophage uh, activation. Um, and the, the pathophysiology is actually pretty interesting. It, it ends up being this persistent macrophage that stares in, stays in the circulation. And this is just from up to date where you have your, your sort of a normal process where you got your natural killer cell or your cytotoxic T cell, which is gonna go in and kind of clean up these decaying macrophages. And the way that's done is there's a long complicated process of inserting, inserting this hollow membrane into the, into the surface of the macrophage called perforin. Uh, and perforin allows all these cytotoxic granules to get into the macrophage, allowing the macrophage to die and then it's taken away and, 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 and apoptosis exists and then the macrophage isn't persistent anymore as it's decaying. But in this disease in HLH, 
there seems to be the final common pathway of a problem with this perforin insertion. And so whether it's genetic issues with a lot of these proteins that are creating a perforin or whether it's an insertion issue, the end result often is a, gen a genetic or an inflammatory process that leads to lack of perforin. Therefore, the macrophage kind of just stays forever, around forever. It's like a zombie macrophage, and it's going to be allowed to, to stay around, start having phagocytosis of other cells, releasing all of its um, cytokines everywhere, and really causing like a macrophage cytokine storm, as, uh, as you guys were talking about. And so there's this genetic predisposition, but infections can do it too. Malignancy is there in autoimmune disorders. And most of them are... Um, with this genetic and with the infections. And the infections most commonly are EBV and HIV. Both were negative in our patient. Autoimmune is probably less than maybe, I think it's two to 5%, but it can happen. Um, and in our case, we don't have genetic studies yet that are back. Um, there's the genetic studies that help make the diagnosis, but a bone marrow itself is not pathognomonic. And similar to your diagnosis of lupus, of SLE, where you need or in the old days, we always talked about four of the 12 ARA criteria. There's also a clinical diagnosis here too. And it's based on this study from 2004 or uh, in blood uh, on the 2004 conference. 95% uh, of the patients will have fever, splenomegaly, uh, hepatomegaly was in it as well, as well as a transaminitis, bicytopenias, hypertriglyceridemia isolated independent of hypercholesterolemia and hypofibrinogemia and 90%. And then hemophagocytosis demonstrated by a biopsy of either lymph nodes or bone marrow, et cetera. Now, the ferritin is a trigger in our case, and 93% of patients had an elevated ferritin above 500, which argues that you can actually have a normal ferritin and still have this diagnosis. But that's not even, when I talked to the hematology and I said that to them, they were like, eh, that's the one you kind of really need. <laughs> um, but I put here what the percentages <laughs> were of, of, of a high ferritin. Um, and greater than 10,000 was only in about 25%. So, um, and then there's some other markers. Uh, in our case, we had this soluble CD25 elevation too, which was in 97%, and we didn't have the um, NK cell activity. But I do want to, just one word of caution, my trigger when I see a ferritin is to think HLH and then move on. And there are, a well, there's just a lot of things that cause uh, uh, marked hyperferritinemia. And in this um, uh, lab analysis or retrospective study, they had, um, I think they diagnosed, they found a whole bunch of people that had a high ferritins. 113 of them had uh, uh, had extremely high ferritins of uh, greater than 50,000, but I think it was only in, gosh, what was it? I think it's in here somewhere. Maybe 18% ended up having HLH. So it doesn't necessarily mean, like I was thinking going into this case, high ferritin, check mark. HLH, there's a lot of different causes of a high ferritin, including uh, other hemologic malignancies um, and uh, other infections is, is the most common ones. Um, so in our case, genetics are pending, but all you really needed was five out of the nine clinical criteria. And so I just wanted to put up what our patient had as recognized by all of you uh, extremely smart people in the audience. Uh, he came in with fever. He had hepatosplenomegaly, he had bicytopenia, he had hypertriglyceridemia alone, isolated, his fibrinogen was low, uh, his bone marrow came back with uh, hemophagocytosis, his ferritin was markedly elevated, and we had that soluble CD25 elevation. So we're still waiting on his genetics, um, and but then knowing now that he's this, uh, you know, what do we do? And the treatment, as also mentioned in the chat, for classic HLH is you have to treat the underlying cause. But then we prefer dexamethasone because that's a little bit better crossing the blood-brain barrier in patients who have HLH with CNS involvement. Um, and etoposide is sort of the, is the treatment of choice. If there is CNS involvement, in addition to dexamethasone, uh, intrathecal methotrexate is often used. And if there's not renal failure present, then uh, high-dose cyclosporin is considered as well. Um, but just as uh, Dr. Glassick said, if we're going to really try to target the cytokines and this sort of release syndrome, maybe tosi or uh, tocolizumab or even anakinra might mean the treatments for the, for the future for this disease. Now, in our patient, he was so sick. He had liver disease. He had infection. He had AKI. He had brain issues. All of this was related to his inflammation, but we were also a little bit worried if we gave him 
this slide worth of stuff, it would it would maybe accelerate his demise. And so what we actually all got together was that's one great thing about Rush is the communication. We all got together with the conference and kind of decided that let's see how he does with treatment of his lupus if that is the trigger first. And so we agreed cyclophosphamide and and, and dexamethasone was going to be our initial treatment. And if that didn't work, or the other way, if his infections went, got out of control on that, um, you know, we would know which way to go. So all of his treatment response, which I showed, which is he's still dialysis dependent, but a lot of his other things have been better, was only so far from dexamethasone and cyclophosphamide alone. He has not yet gotten atopicide, but a lot of his inflammatory markers are, are improved. Um, so that's kind of where we are right now. So um, his, uh, I mean, he really had kind of two diseases, two presentations. He's, he, he's probably really ill from this process, and he also has this GN going on. We've seen plenty of people with you know, GN that looks like this that aren't really this, you know, sick. He's got these fevers and everything else going on and has and And uh, you, you believe you targeted both of them with the therapy that you gave him. Is that right? Yeah, we, we treated his infection as best as we could. And then we thought the next most obvious trigger in this case, especially considering his CD25 was elevated and that, that is more likely to be a secondary HLH, it might be his autoimmune disorder. And, you know, cyclophosphamide is pretty decent at suppressing macrophages too. But it, it, that being said, um, you know, it's possible we could have gone with a more specific therapy. But I think the the conference came out of this was we were also worried that, that other therapy may actually uh, hurt him. Yeah, I mean, he was he was pretty sick there. Dr. Reen? Uh, I have a couple of patients with uh, macrophage. Actually, I did present on our biopsy round, um, a black girl with... Uh, dengue fever and actually her kidney disease. We treated her with actually, it turned out to be she also has lupus now. So we treated her actually with dexamethasone and she came off dialysis. I'm not saying, she, my question is, you think that dexamethasone made it better alone would have been uh, made it better or it's a combination of drugs? My guess is that it's a dexamethasone. Yeah, I mean, we certainly had dexamethasone going empirically early just because of the CNS involvement, the high ferritin. This was on people's differential when we were seeing the patient before the biopsy. So he had been on that for quite some time. Uh, and his mentation uh, did respond to that. Uh, and now, could he have had lupus cerebritis? Could he have had the CNS involvement with this? I mean, it's really hard to sort it out. I mean, in my mind, his macrophages are going crazy and we're trying to suppress it and as, as much as we can. Um, and we could call it, I don't know, I mean, I, it, it could likely have been TAFRO or it could have been macrophage activating syndrome or HLH. There's a lot of different ways I think we could have called it things, but uh, this seems to be the most parsimonious. Hey, just a word of caution about bone marrow. It's not always positive. I think if I my memory serves me right when I reviewed this, I think 40% may not have uh, macrophages in bone marrow, so that doesn't rule it out. So clinical criteria, which you mentioned, hypertrichloridemia, splenomegaly fever, uh, those actually carry more weight than bone marrow normal doesn't rule it out. I'm really glad you said that. Thank you. That was an important point from my reading of this uh, topic as well. Bill, what happened? Bill? <clears throat> sure. Bill, thanks for this very nice, elegant review of a complicated case and I have one hypothetical question for you. Uh, both Dr. Rubin and I mentioned the potential utility of IL-6 measurement in patients like this. It is a commercially available test. You can order it off the shelf. Let's just imagine that you did that and as IL-6 level came back 100 times elevated from normal, how would that have influenced your therapy? Would you have moved towards anti-cytokine therapy rather than a nonspecific cyclophosphamide approach, or would you have continued uh, to approach this as a complication of longstanding? Even without, uh, I was considering using. Uh, can I call you back? Oh, it's, uh, I'm on well. that. Um, and so I kind of went into the conference expecting to come out of the conference, not this conference, the hematology conference and the rheumatology conference, expecting just the opposite coming out that we were gonna be giving Tosi or maybe even Anna Kenra. Um, and, uh, uh, but that was what was great about the conference. Um, uh, but I, I think, yes, if that IL-6 was elevated, 
um, that might have been more weight to pick one of those drugs. Uh, Michael, do we? I don't believe we had the IL-6, and we still don't. Is that correct, uh, Dr. Coleman? Do you have the chart open at all? Let me double check. Give me one. Okay. It's hard to uh, see Bill, how you ignore uh, those. It's hard to say you can ignore that GN. I mean, it, and I just can't believe that those other therapies would cover that. But I, I don't know that to be the case. I, I just don't know. But boy, when I look at this, it still is a renal case. It's a systemic disease, but it's still a very bad renal case. With very with 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 RPGN AKI and a, and and a very bad immune complex GN, which ultimately you've got to turn that off, or he's going to be on dialysis. Bill, what's the follow up on his uh, renal function? He's still dialysis dependent, um, uh, and it's been about six weeks, and he's still oliguric. Oh well, Dr. Rubin. I just wanted to point out that first of all, Bill, that was outstanding. Uh, the story with his grandson and perforin, I mean, that was brought up, at least to me, for the first time by Dr. Susantiram in a great paper in the New England Journal of Medicine. And over the years, the grandson and perforin basically are the end result of damage to the cell. I mean, recently I learned that the membrane attack complex does the same thing. And uh, so I just wanted to point that out. And along the lines of IL-6, now we have drugs that target the cytokine itself or the receptor. Uh, do we know if there is any benefit on one over the other in the illness from your review? Um, uh, yeah, I don't know if we have that answer. Okay, thank you. Great case. Well, it's a shame that he hasn't gotten better. It's getting out there a little bit. Uh... I would, I would hesitate though, Roger. I mean, he, he, his brain was dead, his heart was dead, his lungs were dead, his liver was dead, his kidneys were dead when he came to our hospital, and now his kidneys are still dead, but everything else is better. So he is, and even his muscles and nerves were dead. He was, he's now walking. He doesn't have pain. He's not even on oxygen. I. Yes, I would love it, uh, but uh, I wouldn't be too renal focused here. I mean, I I think there's a very high mortality rate uh, in this disease, and uh, I think coming together at, at Rush with a great uh, team approach was what really helped this man. So what you're saying is that um, is that um, he's lucky to be alive. That's right. Yeah. Great save. <laughs> yeah, that is wonderful. Thanks. I'm going to wrap this up. Thanks, everybody. Great discussion. Uh, thanks, everybody, for for. Uh, for piping in, Dr. Rubin, Dr. Reed, right. Dr. Glassick, Dr. Uh, Kramer, et cetera. Um, great discussion, Bill. I learned a lot. Uh, Good morning. Yeah. And uh, we will be uh, back in, uh, I think, two weeks. Next week, we have the uh, in-service exam for the fellows. So uh, we'll be back in two weeks. Uh, until then, everybody stay safe. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.